Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. As I, as I thought through the theme that uh, I thought of a lot of different experiences. I thought about um, putting ashes on my children's head and how, how does that feel uh, to say dust to dust, ashes to ashes. To, um, there was a conversation online uh, with spouses and especially clergy spouses talking about what it means when a spouse places the ashes on another spouse. And um, just the, first of all, just the intimacy of that relationship of realizing that we have each other for a short time. And uh, I started out thinking a pretty historic, historically and theologically, and uh, I had a little, I was wrestling with it, uh, and so I talked to Joanne and said, okay, I've got this presentation, here's what I'm thinking. And she said, well, that makes me think of Bill Bryson's book, uh, the opening lines of Bill Bryson's book, History of Nearly Everything. And so that all of a sudden set me off on a different trajectory. So I'm not sure how this will all hang together but my hope is to offer you some other voices, to bring some other voices into the room as we ponder what that means, and then for me to share a little bit about what I have come to understand and to know, but also a little bit about myself and how do I live with this sense of uh, uh, being uh, mortal uh, and uh, how do I own that in a way that is important to my life, which it is. And so uh, I'm going to begin with Bill Bryson. So um, this is the book right here, A Short History of Nearly Everything. Uh, you can get it on um, uh, Audible or you can listen to it online. He reads it. I love Bill Bryson when he reads things. His Walk in the Woods was our kind of the first one, if you haven't ever read Bill Bryson, which is hilarious. Uh, and so he just has a real good wit. Joanne can't stand his voice. So... Um, so uh, just to let you know that, uh, you know, when, they, when authors read their own things, it's, sometimes it's good and sometimes it isn't. So here's our opening. Welcome and congratulations. I am delighted that you could make it. Getting here wasn't easy, I know. In fact, I suspect it was a little tougher than you realize. To begin with, for you to be here now, Trillions of drifting atoms had somehow to assemble in an intricate and intriguingly obliging manner to create you. It's an arrangement so specialized in particular that it has never been tried before and will only exist this once. For the next many years, we hope, these tiny particles will uncomplainingly engage in all the billions of deft cooperative efforts necessary to keep you intact and let your experience in supremely agreeable but generally underappreciated state known as existence. Why atoms take this trouble is a bit of a puzzle. Being you is not a gratifying experience at the atomic level, it turns out. For all their devoted attention, your atoms don't actually care about you, indeed. Don't even know that you are there. They don't even know that they are there. They are mindless particles, after all, and not even themselves alive. It is a slightly arresting notion that if you were to pick yourself apart with tweezers one atom at a time, you would produce a mound of fine atomic dust, none of which had ever been alive, but all of which had once been you. Yet somehow, for the period of your existence, they will answer to a single overarching impulse to keep you, you. The bad news is that atoms are fickle and their time of devotion is fleeting, fleeting indeed. Even a long human life adds up to the only about 650,000 hours. 
And when that modest milestone flashes past or at some other point thereabouts for reasons unknown, your atoms will shut you down, silently disassemble and go off to be other things, and that's it for you. Still, you may rejoice that it happens at all. Generally speaking, in the universe, it doesn't, so far as we can tell. This is decidedly odd because the atoms that so liberally and congenially flock together to form living things on Earth are exactly the same atoms that decline to do it elsewhere. Whatever else it may be, at the level of chemistry, life is curiously mundane. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, a little calcium, a dash of sulfur, a light dusting of other very ordinary elements, nothing you wouldn't find in any ordinary drugstore. And that's all you need. The only thing special about the atoms that make you is that they make you. That is, of course, the miracle of life. So welcome. <laughs> it's good to see you. Thank goodness you made it, right? Um, there's a poem called Passing Through and, uh, by Stanley uh, Kunitz. He says, I only borrow this dust. And I began to wonder, well, when did we start thinking about dust and ashes? Like, well, what was that? Where did that come from? And so I turned to the Bible first, of course, to see what was there. Um, uh, I don't know the Bible well enough to be able to just say, oh, it's there in Esther and it's there in Genesis. And so I actually had to use uh, some computer tech on this one. Uh, but I, I did, uh, you know, of course, is the first, first right out of the gate, Genesis passage, right? Which is, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. So even though... I had imagined when I was thinking of the story, I was going to find the dust and uh, the dust metaphor in the creation story of Adam. It's actually after he has eaten of the fruit of the tree of knowledge that the dust comes in, which I think is an important piece of the conversation. In other words, that um, uh, the the understanding of what dust is begins there, if you will post uh, the fall, the theological fall. In Genesis 18, Abraham speaks to God, acknowledging his own insignificance. Behold now, says Abraham, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am, but I am but dust. So again, the sense that dust in relationship to God is a very small thing. What, what does dust have to say to God? Uh, Abraham uh, questions. Uh, by the time we get to Mordecai and Esther, for one, dust has taken on uh, uh, other, other significance, right? So it's not just a metaphor for who I am, but it's something that I might do uh, in response to an event. And Mordecai has just learned of uh, the decree to kill all of the Jews. And so Mordecai himself uh, expresses his, his mourning, his grief over this, uh, this uh, new uh, decree by saying uh, what the scripture says, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud voice and a, a bitter, bitter cry. Right? So all of a sudden, this, this idea of what it means to be dust and ashes has taken on a, a great feeling of remorse, of sadness, of grief. Uh, so it's no longer just what we're made of, but it begins to be articulated in Scripture as something that may be put on in a time of great disaster. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, we get Job, of course. Have to have Job when we're going to talk about things like this. Job's a great book to go to. Job 2 8. Job in his suffering and misery sits in ashes. He took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Again, a response. 
Because you remember now in Job, you may not know this, but Job is two fighting narratives going on at the same time. One of them is saying, Job, you deserve this, and you better get right with God, which is where the ashes come into play in that narrative. The other one says that uh, you, uh, there's no, God doesn't work that way, that God doesesn't need you to do that. And so in, in Job, if you were to actually take it apart, you'll find two very different conversations going on about what repentance uh, uh, looks like. But in the one that it wins most of the, most of the book uh, has to do with, with religious violence and uh, how Job receives the news of his, of his life just getting worse and worse and thinking, what do I do, what do I do? He sits in and, and, and scrapes himself literally self-harming, right, to uh, show how sorry he is to God, um, which makes just that whole story just heart-wrenching, truly. Daniel, Daniel humbles himself before God, fasting in sackcloth and ashes, and I set my face into the Lord to seek by prayer and supplication, by fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And uh, again, this uh, Daniel... Uh, it is picked up by Matthew. Matthew seems to love Daniel a lot, so we get a little bit of Daniel and Matthew off and on. And Matthew picks this up as well uh, with the idea that uh, if they repent, they have to repent in sackcloth and ashes. And again, in uh, Hebrews, we see it turn into sac a sacrificial act. So we have an evolution that begins with being made of dust and ashes, evolving in the scripture to have some meaning of grief, to evolving into an act of, of repentance, right? So that, so that that is now woven in to finally uh, an act of sacrifice. And so rather than me doing it, we will make a sacrificial offering. And the offering turns to dust and ashes and then is consumed by God. So there's a, this is very, the, this, you know, so you can say, Joanne, why didn't you get rid of that part? That part wasn't funny like the first part. But it is important for us in Lent as we understand the language that's going to sweep through our scripture, our prayers, everything as we as we think and ponder not just repentance, uh, our sorrow over those things done and left undone, but then also that sense of a need, what sacrifice could possibly heal the world, right? So, uh, and, and I'm gonna get to that a little bit later. But uh, just to hold all of that there, to say that we have a very similar uh, process that happens uh, in the church uh, the church begins pretty early on to see that when people do terrible things, that public acts of repentance are necessary for them. So probably by about the third century, we know that people are being told that they are no longer a part of Christian community and that they will need to put on sackcloth and ashes and appear publicly during the season of Lent in order to receive the church's repentance and on Easter after going through Holy Week in that manner to uh, be returned to the church. Uh, so, so early on, this is a very individual thing in which people are expressing piety, lost grief for the things they have done and seeking to be returned to the church. This is happening at the same time, by the way, that people are being prepared for baptism. Uh, at this point, adults were primarily the ones being baptized, and so they would spend the same season of 40 days also preparing for an act of repentance, which was a renunciation of evil and the acceptance of Christ uh, and the baptismal formula, which you will hear, you hear in our baptismal formula today in bits and pieces as it's carried forward. But what happens in 1091, about, well, and because we know that because it was a, there was a council of which name I cannot, sorry, uh, history professor uh, Bob Pritchard, uh, but uh, I can't remember for the life of me what council it was. Uh, but I know it was 1091. 
And they decided that everybody needed to do this. Now, who knows why they decided? I don't really know. I'm not, that's not my specialty. But they decided as a group of clerics um, that everybody should go through this repentance time. And so we see it doesn't mean that individuals won't have to also seek repentance in particular ways. But what we know is that by about that turn of the century there, that they had decided that the whole church really needed to go through this. And so we began to see liturgies, ashes being given to people, things like that. So people are acting out, if you will, their repentance uh, more publicly as Christians. A great example of this is uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Henry, who gets into a fight with the Pope at the time. It's just a terrible fight. I think it was Gregory. And, uh, and so he excommunicates him. Gregory excommunicates uh, Henry. And this is because Henry wanted to be in charge of the church. And evidently, the Popes don't like that so much, I guess, right? So, uh, so he excommunicates. And what happens is, that Henry knows how this works, you see. And so he puts on sackcloth and ashes and walks barefoot and meets Gregory on horseback in the snow in the mountains and kneels before him and asks for forgiveness. And the Pope does what the Pope has to do. He forgives him. And you know what? He wasn't pope for very long <laughs> after that. But there was a very uh, uh, holy Roman emperor who continued to be just fine. Uh, the last thing I'll say about history, and then I want to uh, read a little bit uh, more for you, is that the reformers, um, the reformers didn't like all of this repentance business. They thought that was too much of you. <laughs> You're doing too much. This, uh, the Easter ought to be a, and Lent ought to be about God and our, our relationship with God, but more importantly, God's relationship with us. This is what we should be discovering and running around doing all of these acts of really was, that doesn't, that doesn't write your relationship with God because the reformers believed that Christ had already righted the relationship and that your task was to get right in your heart with God and doing acts that aren't attributed to God and doing God's work would, were just acts. They, they just didn't like them. So, in fact, you'll notice in our prayer book, it, uh, the, if you were to look at the first prayer book, um, Joy, first prayer book time, 1556. <laughs> Who knows? It was around that time. <laughs> Rector, James, do you know? Good. Wasn't there a 1549 that he burned? Yeah. I think there was a 1549. Yeah. yeah. We will never publish uh, this talk to you tonight to reveal how bad. I really think it's Pritchard's fault I don't know these things instead of mine. Um, <laughs> You don't, yeah, Joy's nodding. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever you say, Bishop. I your yeah, my wisdom. All things. So, Cramner changes it to be penitence of the heart. So, Cramner himself, being Calvinist, moves us to a more focused attention on our soul and upon our relationship with God than acts of piety, public acts of piety. Now, the liturgical conventions that have come after that have uh, put more of that back in, right? So, so we get to these confusing passages on Ash Wednesday where on the one hand we're imposing ashes and on the other hand we're telling you the scripture says don't show anybody, right? So that's, that's, that's the wrestling out of the theology and the liturgy and the history right in the middle of our own 1979 prayer book trying to find some footing of agreement uh, together. Now, what I will tell you is for me, um, over time, I think I've moved from, from the penitential acts to deeper prayer life. And I don't really know how to attribute 
that, uh, other than my relationship with God has become more important maybe than what I do in the church. And that there's some evolution there for me. I, you know, that I've gone through in terms of discovering how my relationship with God works. My relationship with God is not your relationship with God. I'm not telling you that you need to abandon all piety and acts like that. I'm just saying that I think in early on in my early years, I may have had to practice piety in order to discover conversations with God about the shortness of life, gratitude, things like that. And so today I find that my prayer life is much more uh, a conversation about those things and less about putting on the piety acts that I grew up with. Right, that's, that's what I grew up with. So uh, two short readings uh, um, uh, that will bridge this uh, conversation of piety uh, to, uh, to, to the next part. So the first poem I want to read to you is by Robert Hayden, and um, it's called Those Winter Sundays. And so it's about a son reflecting on a father, just to give you a little setup. It's written in past tense. So as we listen to it, we're hearing the son remember uh, things. And uh, I'll say the last kind of thing I notice in the poem to uh, share with you afterwards. But here, here's the point. Uh, Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the bubble, blue black cold then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering breaking when the rooms were warm. He'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold polished my good shoes as well, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Um, this, when I first heard this poem, what caught my attention was the sense of the son's ingratitude for the father. This idea that um, and, what I, and what I would say I like about it is he's not like heaping on the shame of that. He's stating it quite honestly that his father took care of him and warmed the house every day, especially on Sundays, and had his shoes shined, and that he, until he got older, didn't understand and recognize all that his father did for him that had gone without a thank you. And, and that's a big piece of what I think Lent and the ashes and dust do for us is to help us acknowledge gratitude that has gone unsaid for a God who loves us. It's, it's a season of awakening to what God's work is and has been on our behalf. And so part of, part of that moves away from the focus on me in the season to the work of God in the season. Uh, and it uh, challenges me, which comes to the next point, which I really like. I normally read it. First of all, this is one of Billy Collins, one of my favorite poets, American poets. Now, I know I'm probably, given this crowd, the only person who likes poetry in the room, so thank you for bearing with me, right? I just have to recognize not everybody, so, but you're going to love this one, okay? This is called The Lanyard. And normally I, I like to read it on Mother's Day. Which, by the way, you should know uh, that I never 
sent my mom anything on Mother's, it was all like two days and three days late. So I could call her on Mother's, but I'm just so you know that, the, that when I was 48 and she had got flowers on Mother's Day, she called me instead of me calling her and said, you made it, congratulations. <laughs> the lanyard, the other day as I was ricocheting slowly off the pale blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench, at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one if that's what you did with them. But what did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me life and milk from her breasts and I gave her a lanyard. <laughs> she nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead and then led me into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim. And I, in turn, presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart. Strong legs, bones, and teeth. Two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth, that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hand, as I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. I think this captures the act of stewardship so brilliantly for us. And a time in Lent to understand that all of our offerings are of no use to God. God even says that. Hebrews is one of my favorite passages, which says, God wishes simply for fruit of the lips that praise his name, sharing what you have and doing good work. But I think in Lynn, as we begin to think and ponder the cross, <laughs> beginning, of course, with Bill Bryson and the miracle of even being here. As Rowan Williams would say, not only being here, but being able to ponder such a thing as God, this particular unique human ability to reflect, to remember, to know that we're part of a great story and that our story is not the center of the story, but a small piece of God's great story. And to recognize then that as we know that and we offer whatever we have, what, and because it doesn't matter if it's small or large, it just matters that we're saying thank you and that God actually receives that as if that makes us even. I just love that beautiful way he's woven that understanding and flipped it. And yet, over the years, we have tried so hard, whether we think about it or not, offering different kinds of sacrifices to God. Now, the typical sacrifices are Holocaust sacrifices, where the animal is burned completely to ashes. Right, so that, that we read that in Scripture. That is a piece of that. 
It is also why it becomes the name for the Jewish Holocaust, which is also a name for lots of other Holocausts we don't call Holocaust, by the way, but it is the burning and the killing of animal, human, whatever it is to restore order is a Holocaust. It's a, it's a sacrificial offering. The second one is a cereal offering. A cereal offering are those kind of first fruits is the way we talk about them. It's the kinds of thing that uh, priests would have eaten. So it would be offered, but then it might be cooked or prepared in a way, and so the priests would have eaten what was given. So it was a way of offering to God also to restore order, but it was a, a way of uh, also helping to continue the life of, uh, uh, of, for us it would be church, but uh, to say that we do that in some way too. We also do it in our lives, and the last one being the scapegoat, right? That we will pick somebody in particular, uh, just coming from the idea that uh, an individual animal is killed and then uh, sent out into the wilderness where nobody can have it. Uh, and so the scapegoat uh, also has some meaning for us. And I think that as we, we consider that, what, we, what, we some, what I think we have to come to terms with in terms of, as, as regards to stewardship in our own lives, is to understand that there are these two things flowing back and forth. And one is that we are making offerings to God, but we're also making offerings to God that come from offerings of other people on our behalf. And that we're deeply connected in a whole relationship. And uh, this comes to me as remember that you are dust and to dust you. Remember, remember you're part of creation with everybody else. Remember, I have made you. Remember the story that says that you are going to do these things. And uh, just as the first cereal offering was made by Cain and Abel, it doesn't have good consequences. Right? Remember, remember that you're part of this. Remember all of this and our responsibility for it and that it's not someone else, but it is us. We have a short time to live. It is a miracle that we are here and we uh, hold our lives like this. And what shall we do with them? What will be the story in our short time that we leave behind? I'm always struck when I walk down your hallway of all the stories. What are the stories that you leave behind? The stories you leave behind in church, that's one thing. But what are the stories that your children will remember and grandchildren? What are the stories your friends will remember, your family tells after you are done about what you did with this? Whatever this is. And so I find it amazing. You think of that, think of that off what we do. We get up on Sunday, we've made an offering. They come to the table and remind ourselves that everything came from God to begin with. Remember, that's in the words that we say. It's all God, but we've offered a little bit and then we come forward and we put our hands out like that. And that probably I learned when I took my first communion class. But what we receive is a different sacrifice. Because the only, the only thing that can restore the world was God's sacrifice. Becoming, for a short time, somebody like us but who, as he says himself, maybe sometimes a friend might die for another, right? Takes up and dies for all people. Doing the one thing as God nobody else can do. 
which is transform the world. Doesn't mean that we don't live with horrors of our own making, but they are of our own making. We're all responsible for them. We'd like to pretend that we're not. We'd like to buffer ourselves, but trust me, they're all connected, all of it, somehow. Just have to go deep enough to find the threads of the connections. So in Lent, we come forward. And we remind ourselves that God has made a supreme sacrifice for all of us. And we receive in that bread and that wine a promise. I love the, I love the image this young woman shared with me. I can't remember a priest. It might have been James. Somebody told me about this. Now, this young woman said when she thought of the table, she thought of... Um, it being the end of the table, and not the table, it's just the end. And that it went from there all the way into heaven with God sitting at the end of it, welcoming all of the saints who come before us, all of our families, all of us to God's table, and that we, in the meantime, we're here in our short while coming and participating in what God had made possible through God's sacrifice. So two last things for you, um, because I think this has some very real power for us. Um, one is from this. This is, uh, do you all remember Dandelion Wine? Yeah, right? Ray Bradbury? What a great book. I just discovered that. But this is from Farewell to Summer, the second book, right? So he had two that went together. So to set this up, Douglas and Mr. Quarterman have been at war all summer long. They've been battling it out because the young'uns had decided that the old'uns had to pay for shortening their summer by a whole week. And so they had started out the summer waging, like, war on the old men and the old men would have nothing to do with it they would not give up what they had gained by getting those youngins back in school quickly where they you know could learn to be polite and all those things it's just a delightful book of the going back and forth so we've reached a great detente douglas kept walking and found himself inexplicably in mr quartermain's front yard waiting for he couldn't say what Quartermain, half hidden in the shadow on the front porch, leaned forward in his rocking chair, creaked in wicker, creaking his bones for a long moment. The old man looked one way and the boy another until the glazes locked. Douglas Spaulding, Quartermain said. Mr. Quartermain, said the boy. It was as if they were meeting for the first time. Douglas Spaulding, this time it was not a question but a confirmation. Douglas Hinkston Spaulding, sir. And this was not a question from the boy either, Mr. Calvin C. Quartermain. And again, sir, what are you doing down there so far out on the lawn? Douglas was surprised. Don't know. Why don't you come up here, said Quartermain. I've got to get home, said Douglas. No worry. Why don't we sort out the sick transits? Letting loose the dogs of war, Havocs cried, all that. Douglas almost laughed, but found he could not take the first step. Look, said Quartermain, if I take out my teeth, I won't bite. He pantomimed as if removing something from his mouth that stopped, for Douglas was on the first step, and then the second, and finally on top, where the old man nodded at another rocker, whereupon, remarkably, the thing took place. Even as Douglas sat, it seemed that the porch plank sank the merest half inch under his weight. Simultaneously, Mr. Quartermain felt his wicker seat move up half an inch. Then, still further, as Quartermain settled back in his rock of the porch, sink under him. And at that precise moment, the chair under Douglas rose silently a quarter inch, so that each only sensing, only half knowing, felt that he occupied one end of an inevitable teeter-totter which, as they spoke quietly, moved up and moved down. First Douglas sinking, Quartermain, Quartermain rose, then Quartermain descending as Douglas imperceptibly lifted 
now one up, now down, now the other up, now down slowly. Now, Quartermain, high in the soft air of the dying summer, a moment later, Douglas the same. Sir? Yes, son. He's never called me that before, thought Douglas, and looked at the old man's face, softened with some half-perceived sympathy. Quartermain leaned forward. Before you ask me whatever you've got on your mind, let me ask you something, sir. The old man's voice was quiet. How old are you? Doug felt the breath sift over his lips. Um, 81. What? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. At last, Douglas added, and you, sir? Well, now, said Quartermain, sir, well, let me see 12, sir? Or maybe 13 would be better. Yes, sir. Teeter up, teeter down. Douglas, said Quartermain at last, I'd like you to tell me what's life all about. My gosh, cried Douglas, I was going to ask you the same question. Quartermain pulled back. Let's rock a while. There was no motion up and down, no motion at all. They held still. It's been a long summer, the old man said. It seemed like it would never end, Doug agreed. I don't think it has, not yet, said Quartermain. He reached out to the table beside him and found some lemonade and poured a glass and handed it over. Douglas held the glass and took a small sip. Quartermain cleared his throat and looked at his hands. Appomattox! Douglas blinked, sir. Quartermain looked around at the railings and the boxes of geraniums and the wicker rockers that he and the boy sat still on. Appomattox, you ever heard of that? In school once, said Douglas. The thing is, which is me and which one is you? Which one what, sir? Lee or Grant, Quartermain asked. I think that Lent for me, drives me deeper in a relationship with God such that I realize that we all sit on the porch together. And I'm not sure which one of us is which. But we're on the porch together because God is our God. Christ is our Christ and that there is a unity among us, which comes out in Lent that's very hard to see sometimes the rest of the year. One not of our own devising, doesn't have anything to do with our arguments, our logic, our wisdom, and has nothing to do with any of that except that Christ died on the cross for all of us. And the vantage point of which we're to see each other is from the vantage point that Jesus has on the cross looking over the world as opposed to ours, looking horizontally to our neighbor. Rather, we're to look vertically to Jesus and see how Jesus sees the person standing next to me. And what the scripture tells us about that is that Jesus sees us as family. For from the cross, Jesus says, Peter, this is your mother. Mary, this is your son. This relationship of love that transcends family boundaries, but is rather rooted in who Jesus is and the sacrifice which restores us to unity of which we have some, some sense when we begin our work of land. And the last thing I'll read you, and uh, then we can have a few questions, I suppose, yeah. Uh, is from Jaber Crow by Wendell Berry, and I couldn't find my book. I have no idea what's happened to it. But um, we can't, there is a reason for church. <laughs> um, church is the place like the porch. Uh, church is um, the place where we make our offering, and church in Lent especially is the place where we've we, did, we discovered that we're not all here forever, uh, but that we may have life forever. Uh, and so I'll just, I'll, I'll just end with this piece. Uh, there's so much in this book uh, by Wendell Berry written a number of years ago, but um, uh, he's, he's um, the person who is uh, speaking is Jaber Crow himself who is 
also he's at the bar he's a barber but he also is the church sexton sexton and is uh in charge of the graveyard I thought some of the hymns bespoke the true religion of the place. The people didn't really want to be saints of self-deprivation and hatred of the world. They knew that the world would sooner or later deprive them of all it had given them, but still they liked it. What they came together for was to acknowledge just by coming their losses and failures and sorrows came together for their need for comfort, their faith always needing to be greater, their wish in spite of all the words and acts to the contrary, to love one another and to forgive and be forgiven, and their need for one another's help and company and divine gifts, their hope and experience of love surpassing death and their gratitude. I love to hear them sing the unclouded day and sweet by and by. We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and in times of sorrow when they sing abide in me. I could not raise my head. And I think that's part of what we do is to recenter ourselves and recognize our dependence upon God and one another in this place. And only then can we live. Only then can we steward what we have for the short while that we have it, to do good in the world for God and in response to what God has done for us in giving us a short life, but a miraculous one, an amazing one, with narratives and stories that as much as I love you, I will never know the half of them. And yet this room is full of that treasure that spiritual wisdom that each one of you brings into this place. What a gift that is. And I guess Lent helps me remember that. Refocuses me for the rest of the year. And not just getting ready for Easter, but rather that maybe I could live Easter all year long in a new and different way. So, thank you. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.